Good morning, party people, and welcome to Office Hours from Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. This is the webcast where you put in questions at the URL in the video's description, and then you upvote the questions that you'd like me to cover during Office Hours. Normally, uh, when I do these, uh, I give y'all the view of the ocean. Normally, I uh, shoot the camera over this way, and y'all can go see the ocean waves crashing. But you know what? Today is the day where I am going to get the nice view, and y'all are going to have to look at the complex, the condo complex behind me. <laughs> Life's rough. All right, so the top voted question from <laughs> Merge It Like It's Hot is, Hi Brent, do you have any good resources to look at when planning disaster recovery for Azure SQL Database? Well, the nice thing is, is that for Azure SQL Database, it's just a matter of checking the box for geo-replication and paying for it. It's not like you have work to do there. Microsoft is doing all the hard work of setting up their equivalent of always-on availability groups so that your database can seamlessly, seamlessly fail over from one continent to another. It's just a matter of picking where you want your disaster recovery to be done at and paying that bill. It's not like it's hard work for you. I, I adore that about Azure SQL DB. Because really, at the end of the day, nobody enjoys uh, fixing a broken always-on availability group at like 3 a.m. You know, those things never break when you want them to. Uh, so it's just not, not a hard part of the job. Um, next up, we have Neil asks, what's your approach to automating restores from production in order to test? Now, see, this is also another one of those things that Azure SQL DB just manages for you, that you don't have to worry about testing your restores because you're not even the one who actually does the restores. In Azure SQL DB, you don't even get access to the backups to just kind of drive that point home, why that's such a compelling platform. I, I'm, I'm not saying that I do a lot of work with it. I don't do a lot of work with Azure SQL DB because most of my work focuses on performance tuning, so I don't have to do a lot of that hands-on like architect how do we want to fail over from one place to another? Where does the primary server need to be? Where does the secondary need to be and all that? Says, uh, Neil says, how do you select the last backup? Currently, I select a, set up a linked server to query MSDB on the prod server. No, 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 no. You want to assume that the production server is vaporized. The whole reason you're doing restores is that something is broken on production. So if you're starting by assuming that the production server is going to be there for you to query, forget it. You're going down the wrong path. Instead, what you want to do is you want to go connect to wherever the backups are stored and pull the most recent backup from there. No querying. You're just going by file names. So the easy way to get started with that is go get the open source first responder kit and check out the stored procedure SP database restore. SP Database Restore works with Ola Hollingren's backups, uses their file names, so it'll automatically detect what's the most recent full, what's the most recent differential, and then what transaction logs need to be applied after that. Uh, this is great because you can do restore testing whenever you want without a connection to production, just point it at the file folders. And for those of us who are syncing our file folders across multiple locations, you don't need any direct connectivity between where the production backups are and where you're doing the testing. So it's pretty slick. You don't need any SQL Server connectivity when I say that. Next up, Donovan asks, uh, is SQL lock pages in memory a best practice or an edge case for modern SQL Server? So, okay, there are kind of two, two schools of thoughts to this. Lock pages in memory can have performance benefits under specific conditions. The thing is, most of the servers that I see are horrifically managed are completely not managed well at all. Now, part of that is bias because I'm a consultant. People don't call me in when they're doing a good job. People call me in when they think they're doing a good job and things are really going to hell in a handbasket. So often, I see people running multiple instances of SQL Server, running applications on the SQL Server, remote desktoping into the SQL Server. Lock pages in memory would be a good practice 
if you weren't doing those things. But as soon as you start having competition for SQL Server's memory space, lock pages in memory is a horrific idea and can lead to all kinds of problems. So that's why you see me not really, I kind of avoid that uh, topic in terms of blog posts or whatever, because I, I would like to lead people down the road of best practices, but I see how they configure their servers. It's just kind of tough. It's like saying what's the best practices for a marathon runner to pick their jogging shoes or running shoes. Of course, you wouldn't call it jogging. What's the best practices for a marathon runner to pick their running shoes? The advice that you would give to a professional marathon runner who's been doing this for a long time is very different than the, the advice that you would give someone who's choosing a set of trainers and they don't really know what they're doing in terms of running. These people need different shoes. People who are, are considering lock pages and memory really should get different advice depending on how skilled they are at managing those servers. Next up, Trueshit asks, were you always fluent and comfortable speaking in front of a camera? No. Uh, any tips for someone who feels awkward? Even when I listen to the recording of my advice, it sounds so different in a bad way than what I hear when I'm speaking to someone else. So the first thing that you have to get used to is you just have to tell yourself, okay, I can't do anything about the way that I sound given the time that I have. If you only have so many hours a day and you're trying to become a, a speaker, you don't have time to go to voice classes. You don't have time to rehearse your voice, work on different accents, whatever. This is the tool that you have or the instrument that you have to have. Play that instrument. Sure, it would be nice if you had a different instrument, if you could pick any voice in the world that you wanted, but this is the voice that you have. Of course, when I speak, I hear a different thing than when I play it back on recordings, but I just came to peace with that. I'm, I'm a huge fan of the Stoicism philosophy or being a Stoic, uh, understanding one of many things about that is understanding the parts about your surroundings that you can change and the parts that you can't, and not investing any time or stress in the things that you can't change. I. Could I do something about my voice? Sure, if I had an unlimited period of time, I would totally, I've always wanted to take like singing classes, not to learn to sing, but to learn to project better. I don't project very well with my voice, um, but it's one of those where every time I look at my to-do list and I look at what I want to do in the different parts of my life that I want to work on, it has never raised to a high enough priority while I'm, where I'm willing to dedicate the time to that. That's what microphones are for. <laughs> Uh, so he says, any tips for someone who feels awkward? The first thing is understand that you can't do anything about the way that you sound given the time that you have. And then go, okay, I need to be at peace with that. If you struggle with being at peace with that, pick up a book on stoicism or stoic uh, thinking. Life advice from Brent Ozar. CJ Morgan asks, CJ, we haven't uh, seen CJ in a while. Have you ever worked with bidirectional replication? Yes. I ask because, uh, I say yes, but it's been easily a decade. I ask because we have a client who wants an updatable copy of their database up in Azure, and aside from running a VM in SQL and Azure, the only replication we see as being supported is for, and for updatable subscribers is bi-directional. Yes, that is true. Let me know if you have a question though. I mean, it doesn't feel like, it feels like your question was, have you ever worked with bi-directional replication? That answer is yes. Do I ever want to do it again? No, but there it is. If somebody waves a big enough bag of money at me, will I go do it? Yeah, sure. But I'm so rusty that you'd be, you'd be the, the size of bag of money that it would take for me to take on that project would have to be so large that a client would be stupid to hand me that bag of money when I'm sure that there are other people who are willing to uh, give it a shot for way less money. The thing is that they're willing to give it a shot for way less money because they've never actually done it and they don't know how terrible it is. Uh, so we go from there. Uh, let's see here, my contractor back in Vegas, uh, 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 they are being shipped from Home Depot, should arrive Friday. Uh, is today Friday? Yeah, yeah. Uh, check with Eve to see if they've arrived. I'm down in Mexico. Okay, there we go. 
All right, next up. Uh, Eduardo asks, we have bugs down here today. Eduardo asks, do you keep any interesting statistics on the questions that are asked in each episode of Office Hours, like percent of questions that are new, percentage of questions for topic ABC? Nope, not at all. Easy answer there, right? Uh, I Love Data asks, hello Brent, just curious what the ad revenue on your small YouTube channel looks like. Is that something you would be willing to share? Oh, I'll ask you, have you ever seen an ad on my uh, YouTube channel? Right? Come on now, think about it. It's not rocket science. So your next question would be, why would I choose not to do ads? To some extent, I'm advertising me, right? Like that you're gonna pay me for training or pay me for consulting. Oh my God, I should have worn bog, bug spray today. Um, you're gonna pay me for consulting or con training. Why would I want to advertise someone else's services during my, uh, my YouTube channel? Um, from time to time, companies do sponsor, and I do that, but that's the only way that I would show ads on my YouTube channel. Uh, next up, Haydar asks, does high VLF count or large transaction log file size affect log shipping performance? Let, let, me, let me rephrase that. So when you say log shipping performance, there are three things that are involved with it. Taking the log backups, copying the log backups from one place to another, which isn't always a part of log shipping, but it can be, and then restoring the log backups. What makes backups slower? More data. The more that you're writing, the longer your backups will take. Compression or lack thereof will also affect performance. So when you say do, the number of VLFs or the size of the log file, does that affect it? I, what I'd be more concerned about is how much are you writing to it? And in shops where they write a lot, the log file size tends to be larger and they tend to have more problems with VLFs. But the size of the log file and the VLF count isn't the problem that you would focus on fixing. Those are symptoms, they are not the cause. What you would want to look at if you want to improve log shipping performance, firstly is things like compression and file share speed where you're writing. And only last would you look at the, the amount of data that you're writing because often that's a hard one to change from an application perspective. Focus on the things that you can fix. Hey, there's stoicism again. Focus on the things that you can fix and influence. For me, that's the uh, utilization of compression and the speed of the target share where you're writing the backups. Uh, we'll do one more. CShot asks, what are the pros and cons of using native SQL backup with multi-terabyte databases? And they say 11 plus terabytes. Um, generally, when you exceed one terabyte of database size, you want to ask the question to the business, if we need to restore this database, are you okay with the length of time that it will take? So what are the scenarios when you need to restore a database? Well, if you don't have always on availability groups, if you don't have database mirroring, you don't have log shipping, you don't have something that's already set up and ready to go as a plan B. Or, so those are, those are all valid cases where you have to do a database restore if you don't have those technologies. Or if someone does an oops query, Often I run into shops and everybody and their brother is a database owner. Everybody can do write permissions inside the database. I don't forget even sysadmin. I'm just talking about writing data to where I'm worried about oops queries. Sooner or later, it's a matter of time until somebody forgets to highlight the where clause, for example. I go, okay, as soon as we do that, in a matter of seconds, it's gonna propagate to the rest of my replicas. Now I'm in a situation where I have to restore the database and if I have technologies like always on availability groups, transaction log shipping, database mirroring, now I may have to restore the database or use automatic seeding, whatever, on other places too. So the clock is ticking and it's getting pretty ugly. Those problems become problematic as your database size exceeds one terabyte. 
It doesn't really matter how much you tune uh, databases or tune the restore process when you get to that size. It's never fast enough for businesses. You know, you talk 11 terabyte database when you got to restore for an OOPS query, it can take hours. And so when you get to that point, for me, it's the one terabyte mark where I start to want to have conversations with the business of, look, architecturally, if this thing is going to continue to grow, as, it, as they always do, if it's going to continue to grow and you're dissatisfied with an outage time when we will need to do a restore, it's a matter of time. Then in order to head that off, part A, we're going to lock down security as quickly as we can so that people don't have write permissions in the database. I mean write as in W-R-I-T-E, not R-I-G-H-D. Um, and then also, architecturally, we're going to start moving towards snapshot backups. If you do something that uh, has SQL Server where snapshots, VSS, etc., cetera, uh, gives you the ability to restore a database of any size in a matter of seconds. Um, once you see that in action, it enables all kinds of things, uh, like restoring a snapshot over to development in order to test something quickly. I know you're not supposed to use production data in development, and I know I shouldn't be making a face, but the reality is, is the vast majority of businesses out there are still doing that, are still using uh, production data in development, especially when we talk about things like data warehouses, because you said 11 plus terabytes. People aren't scrubbing 11 plus terabytes worth of data when they go refresh development, and they're not using synthetic data. Sadly, they're just taking snapshots. All right, so that is a good round of the highly answered or highly upvoted questions. I'll go ahead and clear out the question queue now to let uh, uh, people do a fresh round in and start upvoting again. Um, so if you've asked a question recently and you haven't seen it on office hours, that's why. Other people didn't highly upvote it. Uh, so you'll want to post it again and get your friends to upvote it, whatever. If it's, or maybe people just don't care. Accept that people don't care and just go on with your life. Uh, I will now go, let's see, it's 7.30. I'll go make myself a, a new fresh cup of coffee. Mm. And I will leave you with a couple of minutes of uh, ocean wave footage, I suppose, sunrise footage. Have a nice morning, y'all, and see y'all at the next office hours.